Hi there, I'm Robin Chopra, and welcome to the Cotswold Explorer's second Halloween special. This time, we found true stories of murder, corruption, deceit and villainy, which demonstrate that under the cloak of beauty and peace for which the Cotswolds are famous, lurks a darker and more sinister truth. Once you've enjoyed the stories, by following the link in the description of this video, you can buy your own guidebook. Regular viewers will know that we're normally accustomed to bringing you interesting insights into the history and heritage of the region, but tonight we're presenting you with some of the darker sides of the place. This picture postcard, beautiful place, has on many occasions played host to murder, theft, beatings, and alcohol-fueled crimes of one kind or another. In this Halloween special, we're going to tell you a selection of these horrific tales, beginning at the very northern tip of the region, somewhere we visited quite recently, the Quintons. In the little Warwickshire village of Lower Quinton in the summer of 2021, we merely scratched the surface of this sinister tale. The night of Valentine's Day, 1945, is a night long remembered in the Quintons. It was on that night that Charles Walton, a local farm labourer, was found murdered at the Furs Farm on the slopes of Meon Hill. Even before this event, Meon Hill had been linked to many folklore stories involving devil worship. So it is perhaps fitting that such a gruesome event took place here. There is all kinds of speculation around the motive, including ideas as far-fetched as witchcraft and black magic. However, the residents of Quinton are renowned for their silence on the subject, and as recorded during a visit from the BBC some decades later, are tight-lipped to this day. We must tread carefully. Charles lived in a cottage opposite the church in Lower Quinton, renting it with his niece, Edie. The cottage is still there today, converted into one large property. Charles was apparently well-liked in the village, although described as something of a recluse and a loner, with a reputation for having an affinity with the animal kingdom. He had trained horses in his youth. It is said that wild birds would flock to his hand to be fed, and angry dogs could be tamed at the sound of his voice. He was a countryman through and through, familiar with many rural rituals and the ways of countryside. He was perhaps too familiar with it, for it is said that after seeing his strange abilities at work, some villagers believed him to be involved with witchcraft. When his body was found, his throat had been slashed by his own billhook, the implement with which he'd been trimming the hedgerows and he was pinned to the ground by the neck with his own pitchfork. Witchcraft was certainly suspected, as a large cross was found carved into his chest. Previous cases have documented that people have murdered those they believed have put them under a spell. A cross carved into the victim was a sign of the person taking their revenge. To add to the witchcraft connection, during the investigation, a police officer found a book entitled Folklore, Old Customs and Superstitions in Shakespeare Land, written in 1929 by J. Harvey Bloom. A passage in the book tells of a Charles Walton who had died in 1885, 60 years before our victim, after seeing a foreboding ghost. As a result of this discovery, rumours started to circulate, suggesting that because of his alleged involvement with witchcraft, the more recently killed Charles Walton was the same man as the earlier victim. It was a notable case even at the time, and one of the most distinguished policemen in the country was called in to lead the investigation, Chief Inspector Robert Fabian of the Yard. However, despite his best efforts, the crime has never been solved. He had his suspicions, 
but he could prove nothing. Years later, though the event of that Valentine's Day remains fresh in the minds of the villagers, they were unquestionably tight-lipped. In the 1970s, the BBC Nationwide programme visited here in an attempt to discuss the case, but we hear tell that when they went to the local pub in Lower Quinton to interview the locals, the place suddenly emptied of customers and no one would speak to them. Surprisingly, Charles Wharton doesn't seem actually to have a grave in the churchyard. All that can be found is a small headstone with the initials marked CHW. This seems odd, but one theory has been suggested that it was destroyed by a relative who became upset by the media attention and the journalists who constantly visited the grave on the anniversary of his death. There are a number of footpaths round me on hill, so if you like a walk, don your walking boots and explore for yourself. If you choose to follow his path, tread carefully. From here we move south, back into the more familiar central Cotswolds, arriving first at the wonderful village of Chipping Camden. Our story here is from the early 19th century, the year 1835. This is an unusual crime, because the criminal doesn't meet the usual stereotype. Harriet Tarver was just 21 when she committed her act of willful murder. She was a young mother with a perfectly decent record, living in Sheep Street. Her parents were both local, her father an agricultural worker by the name of William Tracy, and her mother, Sarah. Harriet was married at 19 to the 24-year-old Thomas Tarver. She had been to school and could read a little, but couldn't write at all. She worked by her husband's side as a labourer. In September 1834, the couple had had their first and only child, a daughter they named after Harriet's paternal grandmother, Anne. They lived a normal working class life in Chipping Camden, attracting little attention. Until one day, December the 11th, 1835, Thomas died very suddenly. He was young, fit and apparently healthy, so given that it was such a small community where everybody knew one another, it wasn't long before rumours of foul play and murder started to circulate. A few days after Thomas's death on the 15th of December, an inquest was started. The inquest was not initially presented with any evidence of foul play, but it was adjourned for a week, and during this time, arsenic was discovered in Thomas's stomach. A couple of witnesses came forward to say that they had seen Harriet Tarver purchasing arsenic from a shop. They couldn't think why she would need it, but equally, why she would want her husband dead. The inquest jury, after some considerable discussion, returned a verdict of willful murder, and a trial took place on Friday the 8th of April, 1836. On the day Thomas died, he had gone to work at the Noel Arms in Chipping Camden as normal, leaving the house at around 4am. It was shortly after his arrival that he began to complain of stomach pains. He was sick several times, and by the afternoon, he was dead. Two days prior to this, Harriet had bought some rice pudding, and on the day Thomas died, she had given it to him for breakfast. It was in this pudding that she had hidden the arsenic. As she had been seen by several people buying the arsenic, it was rash of her to think she could administer it without question. Not the sharpest knife in the box, perhaps. Maybe she didn't think through the consequences. A post-mortem was carried out on Thomas, and arsenic was easily identified in his stomach. In fact, the coroner, Dr. Thompson, said he had never seen a stomach in such a state. It was as a result of these findings that Harriet Tarver was convicted of murder. It would seem, to her surprise, she had apparently fully expected to be acquitted. She finally confessed to killing Thomas, and the press reported that her motive was that she was in love with another man. She was not given much time to reflect upon her crime, however, for the day after her trial, on the 9th of April, 1836, she became the youngest woman in 19th century Gloucester to be hanged by the neck until she was dead. 
The verses published in the broadsheets to celebrate her execution read as follows. Good people, all I pray attend unto these lines that I have penned. A criminal confined I lie, my crime is of the blackest dye. Harriet Tarver is my name. You'll hear from Camden Town in Gloucestershire. I own the dreadful deed I've done, and now my glass is nearly run. A loving husband once I had, which ought have made a wife's heart glad. But Satan, he tempted him so that I resolved the deed to do. To poison him was my intent, and to take his life I was fully bent. White arsenic I did apply, which for the same I am condemned to die. By him a lovely child I bore, and alas I ne'er shall see it more. O Lord, thou be a parent kind to my orphan child which I leave behind. God grant it may a warning take Of its mother's untimely fate. From the paths of vice and bad company, From all such crimes pray keep it free. When my trial came on you here, With a heavy heart I did appear, The jury they did guilty cry, And soon I was condemned to die. Back to the death cell I was ta'en, Forty-eight hours to remain, and there my time to spend in prayer, hoping to meet my Saviour there. You married women, where'er you be, I pray take warning now by me. Pray love your husband and children too, and God his blessing will bestow. Hark, now I hear my passing bell, now I must bid this world farewell, and when the fatal bolt shall fall, the Lord have mercy on my soul. We move south now from Chipping Camden to Borton on the Hill, for it's here that our next tale took place. The Cotswolds was a perfect area for opportunistic thieves. In a rural region like this, there was a clear line between rich and poor. Robert Jones fell clearly into the latter category. He regarded anyone wealthier than himself as fair game, and his last victim was a man called Stephen Matthews. Stephen was a farmer from Hinchwick, a village not far from Borton on the Hill, and was known in the local community to be very wealthy. He regularly passed through here on his way to Evesham Market, where he sold his livestock. One day, on Monday the 21st of May, 1767, Having made the then large sum of two hundred pounds, he got on his horse and started to ride the distance back home, which was about fifteen miles. He took roads which can be taken today, what is now the A44 from Evesham to here at Borton on the Hill, and then over the Borton Downs, down narrow winding tracks to his home. His route would be well known to locals, including the criminal Robert Jones. In the 18th century, on horseback and in the dark, this route must have been distinctly scary and atmospheric. Highwaymen were known to frequent these kinds of tracks, but Matthews knew the area well and probably felt safe in such familiar territory. Robert Jones took advantage of this and lay in wait on the route to Hinchwick, hiding in some grass on the roadside, watching for Matthews to pass. It is unclear precisely what happened at this point, but it proceeded in as violent a manner as one might expect. One version of events suggests that as Matthews approached, he stopped to relieve himself on the grass verge, this making Jones's job easier. As Matthews remounted his horse with one foot in the stirrup, Jones rushed him and hit him on the head with a wooden paddle. He continued to hit him as he fell to the ground and then robbed him of seventeen and a half guineas. Matthew's body was found the following day with many injuries, suggesting gratuitous violence on Jones's part, encouraging the belief that this was a premeditated murder. As in our previous story, rumours spread like wildfire as to the culprit. 
Robert Jones had not been slightly careful since the event. He had paid off his debts to local innkeepers and boasted about the fact that he didn't need money. This immediately raised suspicions, and just two days after the murder, he was apprehended by a Joseph Knight of Stowe and Mr. Wilkes of Chipping Norton. Much of the stolen money was found on his person. He hadn't had much opportunity to spend it. He was committed to Gloucester Castle, where he continued to insist on his innocence. He claimed that a watch they found in his possession was a brand new one he'd purchased from a Broadway jeweller, but there was conclusive evidence that this watch had belonged to Matthews. It had received a new seal two days before the incident, and this same seal was found on the stolen watch. A truly badly behaved prisoner, he was tried on August the 3rd and sentenced to execution. He was hanged on the 5th, and on the following day, his body was brought here to Borton on the Hill, where it hung bound in chains to act as a warning to other opportunistic thieves and criminals. We continue south to the town of Stowe on the Wold. Murder and robbery, 200 pounds reward, whereas a barbarous murder was committed on the evening of the 10th of March at Stowe on the Wold, on the body of Mr. Francis James Wrens of Stowe aforesaid, and a gold watch taken from his person. So reads a wanted poster, issued after the death of Francis James Wrens in 1834. It goes on to describe the stolen gold watch in some detail, and states that a reward will be paid by Mr. John D. Charles of Stowe on the Wold. To who shall give such information as may lead to the conviction of the perpetrator or perpetrators of the said murder? The victim was François Jacques Rennes, a Frenchman who came to live a quiet life in the English countryside. His name, as per the wanted poster, was anglicised by the locals. He'd been a businessman and a merchant working on the, in the Netherlands, but had moved to England after the failure of his business. After coming to England, he was seen as an upstanding member of the local community. He taught French, and in 1827 he managed to secure a position as the actuary of the Stowe Provident Bank. This is what brought him to Stowe. He stayed at the George Inn in Market Square, and would frequently walk around town after his evening meal. Sadly, his habits made him easy to keep track of and was consequently an easy target for opportunistic thieves. As in our previous story, there was a deep social divide at the time, and there was a general sense of economic misery for many living poorly in the rural communities. His landlord's daughter, Martha Rogers, had seen him leave for his walk at 7.30pm, and she knew he'd be back by 8 to drink tea, when he failed to return, she knew something was amiss. He had last been spotted at about 7.45, walking down Black Lane by local man, Henry Sutton, who assumed him to be on his usual evening walk. Just minutes later, Renz was dead, hit over the head from behind with an iron bar. He was found by Samuel Harris, who was out feeding his horses, who raised the alarm at the George Inn. An Inspector Adamson arrived from London to assist the local authorities, and as usual, many witnesses came forward with conflicting statements. It was eventually narrowed down to two main suspects, a Mr Clifford and a Mr Cox, but it soon became clear that these men had little motive, as they had their own trades and respectable incomes. The investigations continued for some time, until eventually another possible culprit was found. Edwin Jeffrey, a 21-year-old local labourer who had aroused suspicions by trying to take an expensive watch to a local watchmaker to have it mended. When questioned on how he came to have the watch, he said it had been a gift from his brother. The watchmaker was not convinced and went to the police. 
Geoffrey was arrested and put on trial. It came to light that he had waited near a local fish pond for Wrens, had seen the watch hanging from his pocket and struck him down. Later, he had actually helped the locals take Wrens' body back to the George Inn. He hid the watch for a time, but eventually taking it to the watchmaker for repair was to be his undoing. He was hanged in Gloucester on the 15th of April 1835 and was seen praying up until the moment he finally dropped. We journey to the southwest now, following the escarpment down to Winchcombe, one of the Cotswold explorer's favorite spots. There are a couple of dark stories even here. In 1864, in the heart of this beautiful town of Winchcombe, the 28-year marriage between Sarah Alexander and Richard Smith was in serious trouble. Sarah had thought she'd married well, as she had been an agricultural labourer and her husband was a respected surgeon. His brother William was a wealthy local farmer. All certainly seemed fine on the surface, but the truth was considerably less peaceful. Not long into their married life, Sarah discovered that Richard had a very dark side to his personality. It turned out his family had a history of insanity. They were Winchcombe born and bred, but two of Richard's uncles were generally known to have been mad. And one of his aunts had been sectioned in the 1830s and committed to the Gloucester County Lunatic Asylum. It seemed pretty likely that when they first married, Sarah had no idea of these family secrets. There were many warning signs in Richard's behavior. He had threatened to expel one of his brothers from his house for no apparent reason, and he broke all the windows in his sister Anne's house. In 1846, he was said to have caught brain fever and almost died. As their lives went on, Richard's insanity grew worse. When living in Devon for a spell, he became convinced that a signboard opposite his house was actually a camera documenting his daily movements. He would close all the curtains for days at a time to prevent anyone from seeing in. After a while, his family grew concerned, and in 1852, he was assessed by a Dr. Shapter, who concluded that he suffered from chronic insanity. Despite this, he was allowed to continue his normal life. In fact, his family grew as he and Sarah had their last child, Clara, before moving to London and then back to Winchcombe. Their children had grown up, dispersed, and were living normal lives in a number of different trades, but Richard's madness continued to get worse, and eventually his financial situation began to crumble. He rented a house in North Street in Winchcombe, relying on his brother William, who owned a nearby farm, for financial support. On the 27th of December, 1864, their children had spent the afternoon at Richard and Sarah's home. They were still on affectionate terms, despite Richard's mad spells. They all left at different intervals, with the last of their children, James, leaving at 8.30 in the evening. It was half an hour later, at 9pm, that their neighbour, Mrs. Greenhalf, heard a gunshot. She did not, at the time, investigate. The next morning, a Mrs. Wharton knocked on Richard's door, as she normally would, for some milk. She asked after Sarah, but received no reply. After she left, Richard walked to his brother William's farm, and William's son James answered the door. Richard asked for his sister, and as she joined them, he told them calmly that their mother had died. William had joined them too, and in a state of shock, they all left for North Street to find out what had happened. Richard, meanwhile, went to Gloucester Street to tell his other children. William found Sarah dead and called a local surgeon. He found that she'd been shot through the neck, close to the base of the skull. They didn't have to look far for the weapon. It had been left still loaded on a nearby table. On the 28th of December, 1864, Richard was charged with the willful murder 
of his wife, Sarah. In the prison records, Richard's entry stands out. Of his fellow prisoners, few were able to read and write, whilst this intelligent and well-educated doctor filled in his entries in full with excellent handwriting. Despite Richard's defence that it could well have been an accident, his state of mind was the overriding factor. He was surprisingly calm and level-headed during the trial and refused to comment on his actions. He was eventually acquitted on the grounds of insanity. He was imprisoned in Gloucester for one year and then sent to Broadmoor Lunatic Asylum, where he stayed until he died in 1833. Fortunately, his many children went on to live perfectly healthy lives and no dark events took place in the family's history again. Winchcombe is also home to another sinister story of a reprieve that came too late. Born in 1781, William Townley was a local tearaway and petty criminal. The Townleys were an old local family and his parents were hard-working and law-abiding. But William and his brother John were made of different stuff. William was just 17 when he was first caught, red-handed in the act of burgling a local home. He and his brother were sent to prison for two years, but it didn't seem to do William any good. Immediately after his release, he was back to burgling. In 1803, he was charged with a capital offence. At the time, punishment was pretty severe and theft could easily incur the death penalty. Later, it was common to be deported to Australia. William was sentenced to be deported, but instead of actually being sent away, he was kept for seven years on a convict ship at Woolwich, the Justitia. This boat had been used as a prison hulk since 1777 and was notorious for its appalling conditions. He survived this ordeal and was discharged on the 26th of July, 1810. At first, he tried to find legal ways of earning an income. He signed up to the Worcestershire militia, but squandered his initial pay packet of 10 guineas almost immediately and he soon returned to his old ways of burglary to solve his financial difficulties, and in October 1810, he broke into the home of one George Skinner. He stole several things, including clothing, but he was promptly caught and once more imprisoned, this time in Gloucester. At his trial in March 1811, various witnesses testified against him, and the best he could do in defence was simply to claim they were all lying. Not surprisingly, he was sentenced to death. His execution date was Saturday the 23rd of March, as executions usually took place on the Saturday following the verdict. Unknown to William, events were taking place to give him another chance in life. The judge who had presided over William's trial was travelling to Hereford and on his way he was told things that showed William in a much less hopeless light. The judge decided to grant him a reprieve. From this moment, however, it all started to go wrong. The decision to reprieve William should have been sent to the under-sheriff of Gloucestershire but went instead to Herefordshire. It sat in the Hereford Post Office until the next day, by which time the fleetest possible horse, taken by the messenger to Gloucestershire, wasn't fast enough to save the unfortunate youth. When it finally arrived, William Townley had been hanging from the gallows for 20 minutes. A tragic tale. Here ends our gruesome Halloween adventures. We hope you enjoyed these horrific tales. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and visit our website, thecotswoldexplorer.co.uk. Join us next week 